The Katana, Sacred Sword of Japan, piece of crap or totally awesome? Hey folks, so um, in my early days when I was doing my channel at the beginning of, what was it, about four years ago I think I started doing this seriously, and um, I did some videos initially talking about katana versus longsword, katana, katana versus anything basically, because I realised that lots of people out there, and I won't use the term that Metatron likes to use, but lots of people out there like to talk about Japanese swords. Yes, this is a Chinese replica, it's not a real antique one. I do have some antique, um, in fact I have an antique wakizashi down there at the moment, um, but I wanted to hold a katana because that's what I'm primarily talking about um, and the one thing I will say is yes I have handled quite a lot of antique uh, katanas and um, I know people who know a lot about these weapons a lot more than I do I'm not an expert on Japanese swords I suppose I could say I'm an expert on Western swords but I am also an expert on primary sources talking about swords in use in the 19th century and in the 19th century we see people using things like this sabre against things like this katana. And despite impressions, despite things I might have said in the past that maybe imply that the katana is less than a good sword, that's not the case. I've made a video um, in similar to this one in the past where I've sort of tried to set that record straight in that the katana was universally recognised, certainly in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century in the West, as a good sword. Um, and I have never actually really read um, I can only think of one criticism of it in a 19th century source, a British source, um, where it talks about the um, nature of their ability to sustain edge um, damage or edge trauma, shall we say. But generally speaking, they're regarded as good swords and Japanese swordsmen were regarded as, as really good and scary swordsmen. So absolutely, yes, you know, the, the myth, shall we say, of the katana, it is not a lightsaber. It, it, you can't cut gun barrels with it certainly not normal gun barrels anyway, maybe a thin brass one, but not a conventional, not like a rifle barrel. Um, it can't do mystical, magical things. It is a sharpened piece of steel, <laughs> sorry to say that. Um, however, they were really good pieces of steel and really well sharpened. And that's something that the 19th century sources, at least the ones that I have um, found and come across, um, in the West certainly absolutely agree on. Not only do they agree that the swords were fantastically well made and many people brought them back from Japan and from the East they brought them back to Europe uh, in fact going all the way back to the 17th century really um, that was the case um, but not only did they bring them back and prize them and value them and collect them just as they still do um, hence the really good collections we see in places like the Victoria and Albert Museum which is a 19th century collection that shows you know, a great selection of original Japanese swords and, and the British Museum and other places as well, the collections that were put together in the 19th century. Not only were they brought back collected and prized, but they were also feared in combat as well. And not only was the sword respected, but the sword's men were respected in Japan um, and feared. And in fact, there is some advice in period British sources talking about that very fact. So here we have a couple of sources that I've just lifted out of um, Swordsman of the British Empire, which is a book I wrote a prologue for. I'll put the link below. You can buy it on Lulu Books. It's an amazing compendium of primary source material, talking about close combat across a wide period of time in many, many areas. And uh, William Blakeney of the Royal Navy says, A Japanese swordsman was a truly terrible antagonist. Um, and then uh, a little bit later, in 1912, Joseph H. Longford um, says, uh, the thrust is not taught in their fencing schools. In actual fact, it, in actual fact, it was, but just not as accentuated as we were used to seeing in, in Europe. Um, but there is nothing in their swordsmanship, uh, nothing in swordsmanship in the world more terrible than the long sweep, sweeping cut which they're taught to deliver with lightning-like rapidity. So we're talking about Yaido there, essentially the uh, the drawing cut from the scabbarded position for the most part. Um, and then uh, F.J. Norman, um, The Sword of Japan, from Badminton Magazine, 1905, says um, the cuts most in favour with the Japanese swordsmen are mainly of the chopping order and mostly delivered at the head and right wrist. So we're kind of looking more at a kendo or gekken, as it was called at the time, um, approach here. Some few, however, pay considerable attention to the adversary's stomach, so the horizontal cut. Again, these are things which we still see in uh, modern kendo accentuated. Um, and then the Reverend J.G. Wood in the 
Natural History of Man, I believe I've quoted this one before, says, They have a very dangerous cut which is made by the mere motion of unsheathing the sword and takes effect at a distance where an inexperienced person would, would have thought themselves safe. And again, we're looking at Iaido there, the, 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 the drawing and striking uh, method. Um, but they... Uh, very much the sources of this period universally have respect for both Japanese swordsmen and Japanese swords. And um, there's an interesting anecdote here um, uh, that I'll read to you straight out of the book. Um, and it's actually talking about revolvers, but it's talking about it in the, um, within the context of being in Japan. So, Captain V.J. Applin, who was the former commander of um, Her Majesty's uh, Legation Guard um, in Japan, was one of, its, um, one of the revolver's biggest detractors. Um, he didn't trust to the revolver, and this is the reason that he gives. He says, in Japan it was necessary for every man to carry a pistol, but the Japanese, um, with their swords, invariably got the better of every man carrying one, even when he had it in his hand already. The fact is the Colt revolver is the very worst weapon you can possibly have for after being loaded a week, probably not more than one of those five barrels, um, or chambers he means, um, is useful. I've seen 60 men armed with these revolvers, of which not more than three-fourths were of any use. Three-quarters were of any use. I very nearly lost my own life through the inefficiency of this weapon. I maintain the great fault in our swords, so European swords, is that they will not cut. Use them as much as you like, unless you've specifically sharpened them the night before, they're useless. That's probably related to the use of metal scabbards and not very good sharpening methods. In the cut, our swords are useless in nine cases out of ten. The Japanese use two-handed swords. If we could use them, I should say cut by all means, for they never want a second cut. With regard to the small bullet and great penetration, talking about the Colt revolver again, I remember that in one case, after a man had been shot through the chest with two bullets from a Colt's revolver, he succeeded in killing two men, giving one man 16 wounds, every one of which was death. <laughs> Strange statement. This I saw with my own eyes, and I brought in the man myself, presumably <laughs> brought in the body, in actual fact. Um, so, uh, you know, this, and we see many, many cases like this of European sources talking about the um, awesomeness of Japanese swords and Japanese swordsmen. And, um, I've got to say, you know, we see similar anecdotes from India as well, um, where where people used pistols against someone charging down on them. The old 21 foot rule against a knife attacker, for example. Someone charging down on them with a sword and then being cut down with a sword, despite the fact that the swordsman also then died. So it was essentially a kamikaze, essentially a suicide. But, um, Without a shadow of a doubt, I don't want anyone to think that I have a lack of respect for Japanese swords, although this is not a real one, but of Japanese swords um, and of Japanese swordsmanship. Uh -uh, not at all. Um, and the, the primary source material absolutely makes it clear that um, they were very highly respected in the 19th century um, when sabres were being used, for example. Just to conclude looking at the topic from a slightly different perspective, and I might delve more deeply into this one in future videos because it's a really big topic, but in the end of the 19th century, so the 1890s and into the early 1900s, um, things like jujitsu and Japanese and in some cases Chinese and other um, uh, Asian martial arts and arts, should we say, came into Europe and really um, established some degree of interest and following in Europe. We see, of course, Bartitsu carried out by Barton Wright, the system of self-defense is based partly on Jiu-Jitsu and uh, Japanese wrestling, as it was sometimes called at the time. And uh, Jiu-Jitsu got some degree of following in Britain, particularly right at the beginning of the uh, 20th century and the very end of the 19th century. Um, but related to swordsmanship, the, um, Gekken, as it was called and wasn't quite yet called kendo but it was the kind of the uh, the earlier form of what kendo came out of and it had certain seems to have had disarms and kicks and things that modern kendo doesn't have in it um, but Gekken also got some degree of exposure in the west now there's a book by fj norman um, fj norman had served as a uh, british cavalry officer i believe um, we need to find out a little bit more about him but he doesn't seem to have served for a very long time in the british army um, and doesn't seem to have been particularly experienced but he went to japan anyway and uh, he lived in Japan and trained uh, a bit like uh, <laughs> Last of the Samurai he essentially trained Japanese martial arts um, at the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century and then he wrote a book called The Fighting Man of Japan I believe you can get this uh, on Google it's got an introduction by Alex Bennett and then the facsimile of the original FJ Norman book is inside 
So it's called The Fighting Man of Japan, The Training and Exercises of the Samurai. Now what you have to remember, of course, is this was written circa 1900, so it's not really the training exercises of the samurai, so, so to speak, because the samurai had gone by that point. What it really is, is kendo, or gekken of the time, plus um, some jujitsu stuff. So um, what's interesting, though, is there's an article in it, in the introduction, there's an article from the Times from October the 19th, 1905. Uh, 1905. For those who don't know, the Times is a very established British newspaper. And um, there, it describes a uh, demonstration of um, kenjitsu, as they call it. Of course, we know what kenjitsu is. It's what kendo um, grew out of. There's the art of the sword um, and indeed um, uh, jujitsu. So it says, Kenjitsu, swordplay with the Japanese two-handed sword, was illustrated by Mr. Norman and Mr. Miyaki, uh, not Miyagi, <laughs> uh, to the great amusement of the two spectators. For etiquette, uh, for etiquette um, seems to ordain that the Japanese swordsman should bark like a dog over the attack. So this is the, you know, the shouting that we see with Kendo yeah, even today. And crow like a cock when he lands a blow home. Well, this is, this was obviously weird to them, but you know, for anyone who's seen a Kendo bout, it's just normal. It's just the way that you, uh, the way that it's done. Um, Mr. Norman, who remember is the author of, of the book, Mr. Norman also tried a bout with Sergeant Major Betts. Um, who used a single stick. Now this is really interesting, so what we're talking about here is essentially sabre versus katana, um, but in 1905. Um, so this is one, the Sergeant Major Betts is using a single stick, like a sabre, and Mr. Norman is using a shinai, I imagine, it could have been a bokken I suppose, like a katana. Um, uh, so Sergeant Major Betts who used a single stick against his sword, um, with the result that the Sergeant Major was metaphorically bisected once or twice and that Mr Norman got some shrewd blows. But the impression produced was that Kenjitsu is not really or nearly so important an exercise as Jiu-Jitsu. This seems to have been the prevailing view at the um, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, that Western fencing was superior, probably partly because it put more um, emphasis on the use of the point, and they very much considered that the thrust was dominant. Um, they also considered that someone giving uh, large sweeping blows with a two-handed sword was going to get run through. The counter-argument to that, of course, is that the person giving the thrust, the thrust might kill the person and might land the first um, hit as, in fencing terms, but it's not going to necessarily stop the cut landing as well. So you're going to end up with two dead people, or at the very best case, um, two wounded people, or one dead person and one wounded person. Um, but it is interesting that um, they were very impressed with jujitsu, generally speaking, but not so impressed in the West with uh, kendo, kenjitsu, gekken. These are all obviously related arts and related terms. Um, but they were nevertheless. Um, fully acknowledging of the fact that the two-handed Japanese sword was a fearsome weapon. One final point I just want to throw, throw in before I completely um, sign off is that I have often made a point that the katana is actually a relatively short sword. Historical examples tend to have 26 to 32 inch blades and 32 is really quite long for a katana blade. Usually they're kind of 26 to 30 inch blades which compared to sabres of the time, of the 19th century anyway, is uh, pretty pretty short. Sabres pretty much start at 30 inches and go up to about 36 inches uh, in the blade, and certainly short compared to things like side swords or rapiers, which these encountered in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, so they are relatively short sword, but interestingly, I haven't really seen that mentioned in the 19th century sources, um, and I don't know why that is, and it's an interesting point anyway, because to me, one of the disadvantages of a katana against, for example, a sabre or a rapier is the shortness of the blade, the shortness of reach of the katana. Um, but the 19th century authors, as far as I've seen so far, never seem to list that as a problem. Um, the main thing that they concern themselves with is the fact that the Japanese swords have very good edge, in other words, they're made very well, but they're very well sharpened, kept in a wooden scabbard, kept sharp, and they are, the way that they're cut with, uh, produces very fearsome wounds. I should also, um, as a very last point, also add that as far as I've read, they don't imply that the Japanese katana is necessarily a more fearsome cutter than the Indian tulwa. The Indian tulwa is equally respected as an amazing cutter. So uh, both of them were regarded as amazing cutting swords, and in contrast, they were regarded as better cutting swords than sabres of the West of the same period of the 19th century. 
However, the caveat's usually made that that's because the sabres weren't properly sharpened in many cases and were kept usually in metal scabbards which blunted them. Uh, if you sharpened the sabre and kept it sharp, there was no reason why the sabre couldn't cut as well as a katana or a tulwa. Anyway, I hope there's some interesting points there. I'll try and dig out some more sources talking about Japanese swords and swordsmanship in the 19th century because 19th century sources are often the most in-depth and the most, most verbose and the most numerous, so they can often tell us the most information about a particular subject. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.